Kabul, Afghanistan. Hajigalib did just what the U.S. military feared he would after his release from the Guantanamo Bay prison camp. He returned to the Afghan battlefield. But rather than worrying about Galib, the Americans might have considered encouraging him. Clean and weather beaten, he is now leading the fight against the Taliban and the Islamic State across a stretch of eastern Afghanistan. His effectiveness has led to appointments as the Afghan government's senior representative in some of the country's most war-ravaged districts. Afghan and U.S. officials alike describe him as a fiercely effective fighter against the insurgency, and the U.S. military sometimes supports his men with airstrikes, although Ghalib complains that there are too few bombers and drones for his taste. Accounts of former Guantanamo detainees who went on to fight alongside the Taliban or Islamic State have become familiar. So are those of innocents swept up in the U.S. dragnet and dumped in the prison camp without recourse or appeal. But this is a new one, the story of a man wrongly branded an enemy combatant and imprisoned in Guantanamo for four years, only to emerge as a steadfast U.S. ally on the battlefield. At 54, Gallup's face has creased and his eyes are both exhausted and watchful, as though all they really expect to see is the next bad turn that will befall his life. There have been many, including the death of both whites, his daughters, a sister and a grandchild at the hands of the Taliban. I don't have good memories of life, to be honest, Gallup said. In a recent interview in Kabul, he catalogued the enemies he has fought during a life of struggle. First the Soviets, during the Jihad of the 1980s, then the Taliban over the next three decades, and now the Islamic State. More slowly, he recounted the long list of relatives he lost over these decades of calamity from a brother who died in the war against the Soviets in the 1980s to his 70-year-old brother-in-law, who was beheaded this month. The Taliban killed more than 19 relatives in all. Everything has been fighting and killing, he lamented. Now, his latest fight has even pitted him against a man he once considered a close friend a poet named Abdul Rabim Muslim Dust, whom he lived alongside in Guantanamo. While Khalid chose to reject bitterness and fight on behalf of the U.S.-backed government, his former friend Dust now leads the Islamic State fighters whom Khalid's forces are trying to drive out of eastern Afghanistan. But years ago, Stuck in the same camp at Guantanamo, they would spend their days debating politics and religion. Dust, a doer but quick-witted man who was known for the poetry he etched into the side of coffee cups for lack of better writing materials, was at a man that there was only one course of action after their release, go to Pakistan and start waging jihad. He spoke of uniting the whole Muslim world. Galip had other plans. I used to argue with them that we are Afghans and we must support Afghanistan, he said, meaning the current U.S.-backed government that replaced the Taliban. It was a minority view, but he did not worry about sharing it with dust or any of his jail countrymen. We were friends with each other despite our views, he said. How Gallup ended up in U.S. captivity is its own bewildering story. After building a reputation as an effective commander against the Soviets and the Taliban, he became a police chief for the new Afghan government after the Taliban's ouster in 2001. But in 2003, 
He was arrested after U.S. soldiers found explosive devices adjacent to the government compound where he worked. That was apparently close enough. There were also several letters that linked him to Taliban figures, although U.S. officials conceded the letters might have been forged. One of the military officers weighing the evidence against him explained that he did not put much credibility to any of these letters, according to a transcript of the tribunal that left Gleb flummoxed. So why are you detaining me? At Guantanamo, Gleb often explained to his captors that he had been fighting the Taliban for years and had even aided U.S. forces at Dura against all Qaeda. He recited the names of major anti-Taliban commanders who would vouch for him. U.S. investigators eventually concluded that the detainee is not assessed as being a member of all Qaeda or the Taliban according to a military document outlining the evidence. Yet the military nonetheless described Gleb as a medium risk, noting that he could possibly become a formidable enemy given his years of experience as a combat commander, albeit on the government's side before his detainment. Finally, in 2007, Gleb was released. He left Guantanamo angry not only over the psychological torture the U.S. military put him through, but also that the Afghan government for never pushing for his release, he recalled. Yet he was determined not to let the hardship of the past for years alter the course of his life. Bullet decided that he would be guided by the overall pain that my people and my country are going through, that is the most important thing. But his own sorrows would only grow in the coming years. My dream was to go back and live peacefully at home, Bullet said. But nobody let me do that. It began with a road, or at least the idea of a road that his tribe, the Sheen Wari, wanted built in Glib's home district in Angertar province. As a tribal elder, Glib took a leading role in the internationally financed project. Almost immediately, the Taliban began to threaten him for working with the foreigners, and soon the insurgents began assassinating his relatives. Among the first to die was Gleb's brother, caught on his way home from a mosque. After the Ramadan holiday in 2013, the extended family gathered at the gravesite to mourn. But the Taliban had dug up the gravesite and buried a bomb there to punish the family further. Eighteen members of my family were killed in the attack, Gleb recounted. Almost all women and children. My family is finished, Bullet told the Associated Press that afternoon, calling the Taliban inhuman. Back then, Bullet had been on a local peace commission, one of many tribal elders seeking to encourage reconciliation with the insurgents. But President Hami Karzai offered him the chance for revenge. He had little family to look after, and the Taliban would keep coming after him, Bullet recalled the president telling him. The president got him a job as governor of Balikot, the Taliban infested district straddling a highway to Pakistan. He quickly organized the local police force and began going after the Taliban. When I got into the government, I started to destroy them, Bullet recalled. The Taliban tried to placate him, he said, recalling an unusual phone call he received. The insurgent commander on the line offered to find whoever had planted the bomb at his brother's grave and hang him. Bullet rejected the terms. I told them that our enmity is just started. This summer, his Sheen Wari tribesmen requested that he be transferred to districts south, 
to rescue a benighted region called Achen, where a belt of villages had fallen to a new threat. Islamic state fighters under the command of Dust, his old friend from Guantanamo. The militants had pushed ten tribal elders into an explosives-lined trench and videotaped the blast that killed them. When Bullet arrived as the new district governor, he placed on his desk a photograph of his two-year-old grandson, killed in the cemetery bombing. Each time I look at it, it makes my heart burst and that motivates me, he said. That's why I carry on all the operations myself. In one battle this summer, Bullitt described how he and his son led a force of police officers and soldiers against Islamic State fighters who were threatening to overrun Etchen's small district center. After being hit by multiple roadside bomb explosions, most of the forces fell back, leaving Khalid and his son alone to face some 15 Islamic State fighters. We were able to shoot many, he said. At such times, Khalid said, he would not be surprised to find us among the jihadis shooting back at him. The rumor is that Dust is usually on the front lines. But Gullet said he would have little to say to Dust at this point. He slaughters civilians, innocent people and children. We will not spare him if I face him on the battlefield, Gullet said matter-of-factly. And given the chance, he said, he will also not leave me alive. The two last saw each other a decade ago, in 2005, in Guantanamo. The Americans had concluded that Dust was no longer a threat and sent him home. It is very ironic that Muslim Dust got released before me, Bullet said. He himself had two more years to go before the Americans finally released him, too.